Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here this evening. Um, another Wednesday night service together. Can't wait till the time we'll be able to meet face to face. And if you um, received our email or our announcement recently, then you'll know that our first service together face to face uh, is currently planned for the first Sunday in June, June the 7th, which also happens to be our regular homecoming. And so it'll be a great, a great way to, to welcome everyone home on that Sunday at 11 a.m. for our uh, homecoming Sunday. So I hope you plan to be here for that if you can. Of course, if you're sick, you should stay at home. And if you're concerned at all about meeting publicly, then please feel free to stay at home. You don't have to be here, but I know that some are itching to be back. And so we're going to try to be as safe as we possibly can and meet together once again in God's house and worship together, sing together around his word as well. We want to begin this evening just by having prayer together, and so I hope that you will find a comfortable spot. Uh, it's evenings like this that, in a way, I'm glad that we're not having services. You don't have to get dressed to go out in the rain. I uh, thought about uh, uh, what a blessing it was this evening for you to be able to be at home in your fuzzy pajamas in a nice, quiet place, uh, watching uh, as uh, we bring the Word of God. Uh, but find a place that's quiet. Turn everything off that might distract you. I I'm sure you'll get the most out of it if you'll just uh, uh, listen and participate like you would if you were here uh, with us this evening. But let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings upon our service tonight. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just thank you today for your love for us. We thank you for your constant presence with us. Lord, we're reminded especially during days like this that uh, though we cannot meet together face to face, because you are omnipresent, you're with us wherever we happen to be. I pray that we might acknowledge your presence tonight as we uh, come together and worship you, uh, agreeing in our hearts on these things. I pray the Spirit of God would have free course in our um, hearts tonight. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your leading, and Lord, give us a willingness in our hearts to be obedient to the things that you point out to us tonight in your word. Lord, I pray you might be with those who uh, are sick with this coronavirus, for those also that are uh, in harm's way. I pray that for those that are health care workers on the front lines, we are thankful for them and for the brave uh, service industry as well that, that prepares food for people and that comes in contact with folks that may have this virus. I pray you might give protection to them. Lord, we pray for our law enforcement officers that you might uh, protect them also during this time. Lord, we ask that you might be with first responders, and Lord, for those especially that have been affected by this virus, please give healing and help them to recover. We do pray, Lord, today for our country, for our nation, for the leaders of our nation, that you might give them wisdom from on high. I pray that they might seek wisdom from you, uh, Lord, acknowledging that you know all things, and I pray you might give them peace as they make decisions that uh, affect us. I pray, God, that they might have the people's best interest at heart when they make these decisions and that they would not be uh, uh, skewed by political affiliations, but they might make the best decision for the benefit of uh, the good of the people that they represent. We pray tonight, Lord, that you might use your word in a very powerful way to provide for us what we need today. I'm thankful that we have a personal God, one who knows us from the inside out and who knows what we need from the Word. I'm thankful today that we have a Bible that's inexhaustible and that it's able to meet the needs of, of God's people wherever they happen to may be. And I pray, God, that you might lead us and guide us tonight into understanding your truth, and, Lord, show us in practical ways how it applies to our life in general. We'll be careful to praise you, Lord, for the outcome. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, we want to begin our study this evening, or rather continue our study in the book of Hebrews. And so if you have your Bibles there, please turn over to Hebrews chapter number six. That's where we left off last week. And uh, last week, uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, actually uh, presented a challenge before the people that he's writing to here. Um, it probably... Uh, sobered them up. It probably got their attention because he literally challenged their faith. Um, you know, he brought to mind that that our, our, a genuine faith in Christ also uh, brings with it evidence of that faith. And he challenged these believers in reference to their spiritual growth last week. And he was greatly concerned that they might be falling away from their newfound faith. That goes 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 along with the theme of the uh, uh, of the entire book, being faithful to the finished faith. So our text tonight picks up where we left off last week. We're going to begin reading in verse number nine, and going all the way through the end of the chapter. So let's let's read it together right there. Open your Bibles and. Let's read it together as God speaks to us from his word. It says, verse 9, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful or lazy or sluggish, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, Blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had prayed, patiently endured, Abraham that is, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, or it settles the issue. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, wherewith the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. One of the greatest dangers facing Christians is to lose sight of the basis of our hope. When we become so burdened with the storm around us, the stormy blast of life, that we forget our hope, then we face the slippery slope of sluggishness, doubt, and even worse, the possibility of falling away from our faithfulness. Notice, I did not say falling away from our faith, but falling away from our faithfulness. And that's what's in view the, uh, the context of last week. I have no doubt that the people that the writer was writing this letter to were genuinely saved. But the evidence of their salvation was not seen as clearly because they had not grown in their Christian faith. Therefore, they were sluggish in their faith. The evidence wasn't seen. They needed to grow spiritually. So in the first part of chapter 6, we saw the warning that was issued to those that had never moved past the stage of spiritual immaturity. There were still babies. And those hard words that the writer said to them 
must have discouraged some of them. In fact, he was concerned that it may cause them to fall away. So I believe in the rest of the chapter, he chooses to bring words of encouragement. And I, I try to do that even when I preach. If I have to share some hard words with the brethren, I want to follow up those words with encouraging words, words that will strengthen them and not continue to discourage them. Sometimes we need to hear hard things. Sometimes our sin needs to be brought to light. Sometimes we do need to have our toes stepped upon, but it's a wise preacher who realizes the value of giving encouragement after he gives those hard words. And so I believe that's a, what the writer is trying to do in the rest of this passage, because in verse 9 it says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Our text for today describes the believer's hope, and he calls it an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. So I've entitled the message this evening, Hope in Christ, Our Anchor. Hope is a very precious biblical word. Now hope in the Bible does not mean a doubtful longing as when one might say, I hope so. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope to be famous, etc., which means things probably will not happen the way I hope they will. But New Testament hope is a confident certainty, a confident certainty. It's also related to the concept of assurance. In Hebrews 6, verse 11, it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope under the end. Let me ask you this evening, do you have the assurance of your salvation? Do you know for sure that you're saved? If not, you can be when you place your faith not in your performance, but in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. When you come to him by faith and you trust him as your savior, he's the one who saves you. You do not save yourself. And though you may fail as a Christian, you will never fall completely as a Christian because he holds us up. In that we find great assurance. And we'll talk more about that this evening as we look closer as our, at our text. As we look at these verses in the book of Hebrews, we can discover three tremendous truths about the believer's hope, where we find our hope. And the first thing we see in verses 13 to 18 is this. Our hope is grounded in the promise of God. Verse 13 says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply me, Thee, And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise for men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 18 speaks of two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. What is immutable things? Uh, the word immutable means fixed, unalterable, unchangeable. What he's saying is that we can find great confidence in faith in the fact that God never changes. His word never changes. Examples of the use of the word immutable in ancient writings show that immutable was actually used as a technical term in connection with wills. In other words, the will cannot be altered or changed. What are those two immutable things that cannot be altered or changed? Well, the first one is God's promises. God's promise cannot be changed. Notice verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear no, by no greater, 
he swore by himself. It speaks of God's promise to Abraham to bless him, verse 14, and to multiply him, to make of him a great nation. That promise, though seemingly slow in coming, it was fulfilled. And by the way, it's still being fulfilled today because if you're saved, you're a son of Abraham. You're a part of that great number. But there was the giving of that promise found over in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Find that in your Bible and read along with me. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is where the promise came about. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, according to Genesis 12, 4, a couple of verses later, at that time, Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from the land of Canaan. Now, that promise was renewed over in Genesis 13, verse number 16. There it says, Genesis 13, 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then, he, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And then it was renewed again in Genesis 17, verse 5. It says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now the promise that God gave Abraham was an immutable covenant an immutable promise that could not change. It was a promise for a land, a nation, a kingdom, and ultimately for a redeemer. We read these promises in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and they're being fulfilled even in our lifetime. Remember, it was God who gave the promise, so they're certain to come to pass. One reason we find our hope in the promises of God is because every promise he's ever made has come to pass with the exception of a few that we're still waiting for. The fact that he promised these things, we can find great hope in the promise of God. Listen, you can't always find hope in the promise of men. Men often promise things that they don't fulfill. We're heading into another political season where politicians promise all day long that they're going to do certain things for the people that they want to vote for them. Uh, very rare does, do you see a promise fulfilled. Thankfully, in recent days, we have. But people are always promising to do things. Perhaps you've done that before. Perhaps you've made a promise to do something, but you didn't fulfill that promise. Well, there's never been a time in the history of this universe where God made a promise that he did not fulfill. So that's the first of the immutable things he mentions here, the promise of God. You can, uh, you, you can also equate that with the word of God. God's word is good, isn't it? It's always good. You can take it to the bank. If God says it, it's going to happen. So it's one immutable thing. The second immutable thing is the oath of God. But going back to the promise, the giving of the promise to Abraham. It was followed by a time of waiting. Uh, it was a period of hope. When the only thing that Abraham had was the word of God to hope on. And he was waiting and he waited and he waited and he waited and he made some mistakes along the way because he hadn't seen it fulfilled yet. But finally there came a time where that promise was realized. Hebrews 6.15 says, And so after that he had patiently endured waited, he obtained the promise. Abraham was a hundred years old when he became the father of Isaac. He obtained the promise that God had first made 25 years earlier. That's a long time, 25 years. Now, from the perspective that I'm living in today, 25 years doesn't seem to be very long. But when I was 25 years old, 50 seemed like a long ways. But 25 years is a long ways to wait for a promise to be fulfilled. Uh, but it was fulfilled. So the, the first thing is the promise of God. It's immutable. The second thing is God's oath. 
His oath cannot be changed. Verse 16, uh, 17 and 18, it says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. What are those immutable things? Well, as I mentioned, God's promise and God's oath. Although I was reading uh, Dr. J. Burnham McGee's commentary, and he believes that those two immutable things are the resurrection of Christ and Christ's ascension and intercession for the saints. While both of those things are true, and we find great hope in those things, the context seems to teach that those two immutable things refer to the promises God has made and the oath also that he made. Since God's promise is trustworthy. Now, technically, it was not necessary for God to make an oath because he never, he never did not fulfill a promise. But for our benefit, he made an oath to confirm and strengthen that promise to us. Now, a person generally makes an oath by a greater authority than himself. If you go into a courtroom uh, and you swear an oath, they want you to put your hand on the Bible. What you're doing is I'm swearing based upon the Bible that I'm telling the truth. Some people even swear by their mother's grave or their father's grave they're t telling the truth. But again, those people are only as reliable as their character. God promises us these things, and then he makes an oath, and it's based upon his character. It says there's no other person that's greater for him to swear to than himself, so he swears on his own word. And it goes to character. The promise is based upon God's character, that he is not a liar, and that he will do what he says he will do. So the believer's hope is grounded in the character and the absolute dependability of the promise of, of God, which is found in his word. So again, our hope is based on the word of God and the character of God. So in that we find hope. Now, as we go on in the passage, the second thing that we see is that our hope is a comfort for the soul. Verse 18, the second part of the verse, it says, we might have a strong consolation. That's a word that means comfort. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. A doctor once said, hope is the greatest medicine in the world. It can cure almost anything, just hope. What kind of hope do we have as followers of Jesus? Well, Romans 8 verse 24 speaks of a hope that saves and brings salvation. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3, is called a living hope. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 2, it's called a secure hope. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, it says it's a patient hope. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, says it's a glorious hope. That's the verse that says Christ in you. The hope of glory. In Romans 15 verse 13. It says it's a hope that abounds. It gets more. It gets bigger and bigger. Titus 2.13 calls it a blessed hope. Referring to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Romans 12 verse 12. Speaks of a joyful hope. 1 John 3 verse number 3. Is where we find a purifying hope. Those that have the hope in the second coming of Christ will live pure lives so that they might be ready for him to come, uh, not with shame, but with confidence. So our hope that we find in the promise of God and in the oath of God, in the word of God and in the character of God, that hope is a comfort to the human soul. But then finally, and, and I believe it's one of the key thoughts of this passage. In fact, it's the one that jumped off the page to me and the one I've been meditating on all day long is the fact that our hope is an anchor for the soul. Verse 19, it says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, 
wherewith the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I was reading about anchors today. Uh, you know what the largest anchor is today? The largest anchors are found on the 10 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers uh, in the service of our country. Each of those anchors weighs 30 tons, 30 tons. Now, the newest and largest aircraft carrier in the world is the USS Gerald Ford, just launched in 2017, I believe. And its anchors weigh 15 tons each. That's a pretty big anchor. Thinking about anchors, what do they do anyway? Well, anchors keep you from drifting. And if you'll think about it, that's exactly what these Hebrew believers were doing. They were drifting back to what were, they were comfortable with, that is, Judaism, the, the traditions of their fathers, because this Christian thing was becoming difficult. It was causing them to be uneasy. And some of them were entertaining thoughts of going back to what was comfortable. And so they needed something to hold them down, something to bring them back. So an anchor really keeps you from, from, from drifting. You know, believers, we're sometimes like ships being tossed to and fro by the winds of adversity in this life. The days we're living in today, are, are un, they're different than what we're used to. Things are changing almost on a daily basis. It's unsettling. And if we're not careful, we'll be drifted back and forth by this adversity. And God says, I want you to be held still. I want you to be secure. And the anchor that will hold you down is the hope that I give you in your relationship with Christ. Our only hope is our anchor. Have you ever noticed why anchors are shaped the way they are? They're designed to be very heavy, and they're also designed in such a way that they get snagged on the bottom. I was reading that the, some of the best things to snag your anchor on would be like uh, clay on the bottom of the ocean or large rocks on the bottom of the ocean. Shale is not a good rock because it, it gives way. But uh, the, the anchors are shaped in such a way that they have sharp edges in some cases that they, they might hang up and, and, and hold the ship in, in its place. Um, in order for things to work the way they're supposed to be, the ship has to be attached in some way to the anchor. Now, it's attached, the ship is attached to the anchor by what's called a road, R-O-D-E, uh, and it refers to the cable or even the ropes or a combination of the two. Uh, I bought an anchor one time, although I never owned a boat. Uh, we had an opportunity to go on vacation one summer to a good friend's place down on Lake Wateree in South Carolina. Charlie James and his wife Patsy owned a place, and they allowed us to go and stay at their place for a vacation. I was preaching a revival the week before. My wife and my uh, kids and, and her mother went down and set up, set up house there in their little cabin, and uh, Charlie owned a pontoon boat. And he said that we were welcome to use that boat to go out on the water, to, to water ski. It was powerful enough to even to pull a water ski. My boys loved riding on the, he had this large uh, blow up alligator and they, they, uh, they, they hung onto that alligator and I drug them all over the, the, the lake. And they tried to ski, uh, but they gave up on the skiing idea. But we decided one day we would go fishing. And so we took that pontoon boat out and we found a nice um, uh, calm spot to fish in. And so I thought uh, we better throw the anchor out so that we don't drift too close to the shore. So I saw the anchor in the bottom of the boat and I tossed it overboard. And as it was going overboard, I was watching the cable follow it and follow it and follow it. And then all of a sudden the cable went over the board too. You see, I failed to attach the cable to the boat. And so it went to the bottom. And so I ended up buying an anchor that I never really needed, but I bought one for Charlie because it was in the bottom of the lake. Well, anchors are important, 
but they have to be, you know, they have to be attached to the boat. Uh, and so I'm thinking about what is it that attaches us to our anchor, our hope in Christ? Is it not faith? The rope of faith is what attaches us to our anchor. We have hope in Christ as an anchor of the soul, which is sure and steadfast. And our hope is grounded in the promise and the oath of God. Our hope comforts the soul. It's a certain thing. God has never one time not fulfilled the promise. I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus returns. That's a promise. Jesus told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return. That's a promise. I will return and take you unto myself. And there will be forever and ever for the, with the Lord. The word of God, the same word of God that promised that Abraham would be the father of a nation, which he was. That same book promises the second coming of Christ. And though we're swimming in the midst of a tumultuous ocean in this world today, being tossed to and fro by every wind, by every wind of adversity. We can hold still. We can be held securely by the hope we have in Christ. He is the anchor of our soul. Today, some people might say, well, I hope I'm saved. And that, when you say something like that, it's it's, it's speak, speaking of uncertainty and doubt. Like there, maybe I'm not, but I hope I am. I want you to know this evening that my hope is anchored not to the ocean floor, but in heaven itself. If you're saved, that's where you find your hope. Harry Ironside, which uh, I used to, to love reading his books. In fact, when I was first ordained, Miss Mamie Capps, gave me a copy of his book called Ordained of the Lord. Uh, Harry Ironside never was ordained by a church. He was ordained, he said, by the Lord. Harry Ironside was a great preacher, but at one time he truly did doubt his salvation. There was a time where he believed that a person could lose their salvation. And it brought him to the point that he actually admitted himself to an insane asylum. And while he was in that asylum, he met a woman who gave him a gospel track. And he realized that salvation is from God, not from man. And he trusted Jesus that day. And from that day forward, he preached salvation by grace alone through Christ alone, by, by faith in Christ alone. And so Harry Ironside tells of an interesting custom in ancient seafaring. He says, sometimes sandbars across the entrance to a port made it impossible for large vessels to enter the port at low tide. So a sailor or a forerunner in a small boat would take the anchor across the sandbar and let it down in the harbor. Thus the ship was held steady and safe. And when the tide rose, it would enter the harbor because the anchor would pull it in there. Jesus is our forerunner. He's entered into the harbor, the heavenly holy of holies. And there he makes intercession as our great high priest for his people still on the earth. His presence there is our assurance that the promises he made will be kept. He has taken the anchor, it says, into the veil, the veil of the holy of holies. He is our intercessor in heaven. He is our great high priest, which goes along with the context. Uh, uh, and it goes on, and it mentions after the order of Melchizedek, which we'll talk more about in chapter number seven. So in conclusion, we're living in difficult days. And sometimes the storms of life can almost take us under. And they can almost smash us into pieces on the rocky shore. But in times like these, as the song says, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. 
This rock is Jesus, the only one. Make sure that your anchor holds. Our anchor as believers is the hope we have in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you and praise you tonight for that anchor, the hope that you give us, because you've never one time failed in your promises. Because we can trust you because your character is pristine. Your character is impeccable. Your character and your promises are immutable. Lord, you are immutable in nature. You never change. The one thing in the entire universe that never changes, that's you. You're our God. And your son Jesus is our Savior. We come to you in his name and we praise you today for never changing. Help us to find confidence and comfort in the fact that our hope lies in you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, folks. We'll see you soon.